Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Welcome to our continued se seminar, The Journey of Self Discovery. So, we started our seminar on search for happiness. Should I ask again? Anybody woke up today wanting to be unhappy? No? Okay. All right. Well, we all have the same goal. So, last time we talked about who am I? So, who are we? Spirit soul. And who are we now? And what is the importance of knowing such thing? Going back to God. Going back to God. To be happy. To be happy. We have to fuel our soul, the spirit soul. We have to connect the soul. The source of happiness comes from the soul, not from the body. The body is matter. And we know that the body has needs, but also the soul has needs. And so, the question is, what are we doing to nourish the soul? We certainly are nourishing the body, feeding it, resting it, bathing it, dressing it, taking it out to all kinds of, all kinds of activities for the body. But what are we doing to feed and nourish the soul? Because if not, we are like that lady who had the beautiful bird. And what did she do her whole life? Beautifying the cage. And in all her effort to polish the cage, what did she forget to do? Feed, Feed the bird. bird. And the bird dies. So like that, we have to nourish the soul. So that is who am I. So now we're coming to this very important topic. And um, we can bring this poster here. Maybe we can set it up here. I hope it won't block the screen. I'll still give us Is that blocking the screen? No? Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about this. But so we're going to talk about why do bad things happen to good people? And why do good things happen to bad people? <laughs> Both are troubling. And it's going to take us two weeks to discuss this topic. So the first part of this topic is going to get to the preview of this answer. And then next week we'll get to the crux of it. Through understanding the laws of karma. And then we really get to the final module. Which is, okay, how do we wrap this all up? and apply it in our day-to-day -day life. What does it mean to nourish the soul? What does it mean to reconnect with the Lord? How is it I'm going to start to experience this happiness that I'm looking for? Not some time out in the future, but immediately. Because we want instant results. So we're gonna deliver instant results. And we give an easy four-part formula, A, B, C, D. You can all remember it, A, B, C, D. It'll be the path to beginning our spiritual journey. And that is the path to God. So we learned, you know, that God is eternal. He's full of knowledge and bliss. And the Lord is enjoying unlimited bliss and happiness. And so the question obviously that arises is, why are we here suffering so much? If we are part and parcel of God, we are also Sat, Jit, and Ananda. Then why are we left to suffer? What is the cause of that suffering? Who is responsible? If the Lord is so merciful, so loving, wouldn't he stop all of this? seemingly nonsensical difficulties and suffering? So that is the question we're going to answer. Because if we don't answer it, it will lead to so many conclu faulty conclusions. And an incomplete answer to this question is what leads many to doubt the existence of God in the first place. And so we're going to conclusively answer this over two sessions. I'm going to cover a couple of these when we come back. So the question is, if God created this world, He is the creator, then why is there so much difficulty in it? Why is there so much suffering? And who is responsible for that? Is it the Lord Himself as a creator? Or is it something else? Or someone else? So that is what we'll answer. So in the Bhagavad Gita, there are five main topics covered. And these five topics cover the entire substance of all knowledge that there is to be acquired. Actually, at the end of the day, 
if we want to boil down all Vedic knowledge, we can, you know, we can exhaust our brain's uh, mental capacity to infinitum, trying to understand this, that, and the other. But at the end of the day, perfect and complete knowledge is summed up in three things. Who am I? Who is God? And what is my relationship? Who am I? Who is God? And what is my relationship with God? These three things actually complete, comprise the totality of everything there is to know. And when we know that, then everything else becomes clear. So, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna covers these five topics. I'll move this on this side for a second. So he covers uh, topics of Ishva, the Supreme Lord. And Jiva, the soul. So these two we have already covered. In the second module, we covered about God. And in the third module, we covered about us, the spirit soul. So today, we're going to cover Prakriti and maybe a little bit of time. We may skip time, depending on how much time we have. And then we'll come to next week to answer karma. So these five topics, when we understand them clearly, all of our confusion dissipates. When we understand the interworkings of these five topics, then we find clarity of everything that we need to do. And without it, we'll actually become very confused. And when we see bad people getting good things, we maybe think, oh, maybe this is the way I should follow. And we start making actually faulty conclusions. So with a firm understanding of it, and this seminar really will give us an overview of all five, and then we'll begin discussing this Bhagavad Gita verse by verse, and we're going to unpack each of these five into more detail in how it applies. So this is really the summary, but the whole substance of these five topics is what is covered within the Bhagavad Gita. Who is the Lord? Who is Jiva? This property, this nature, this world around us, both spiritual and material, this time factor, and the laws of karma. Okay? So let us understand, now I'm going to move this back a little bit so you can see. And if you want to, you can come up at the end and see this very interesting schematic. But let us understand where the soul has come from and where has it come to. Where it's come from and where it has come to. Very important. Okay? So this is the summary of the creation. I have the schematic here. And it is above this what is called the Brahma Jyoti, the Viraj River, is the spiritual world. And below is the material world. And within each material world, we'll get into a little bit of uh, create, uh, description. But the spiritual world is called Vaikuntha. Vaikuntha means free of anxiety. Kunta means anxiety. Vai means free. So there are no anxieties. And the material world is where we are now. And we'll see what Krishna calls the material world in a couple of slides. So let's first put in perspective this material world. So this is one universe. Think of a universe as a ball, a globe, and it is filled half with water. That water is called the Garba Ocean. And on that ocean lies Garba Dakshai Vishnu. And from the navel of Garba Dakshai Vishnu stems one lotus. And atop that lotus is Lord Brahma. And then below that uh, lotus are 14 planetary systems that revolve around this lotus step, from the higher planetary system to the lower. We are in the middle planetary system called Bulo. And within each of the 14 systems, there are millions of planets. So just to put it in context. Okay? So this is one universe. And these universes are emanating from the pores of the skin of Karnadakshai Vishnu, also known as Mahavishnu, who's lying in the corner of the spiritual world. So how many universes are there? I think I gave the example previously. But if you were to walk on a mile long beach, as many grains of sand there are, each grain of sand would represent one of these universes. If you pick up just a handful of sand, a week's time you could not count them. It's so many. So you can imagine on a mile how many universes there are. And within each universe, there are millions of planets. So we are in one of those grains of sand. And within that grain of sand, 
We are in one of millions of planets. And we're sitting in one country, one state, one city, one home. So if we get our sense of our perspective from this. Um, so and this whole material creation is comprised of one-fourth of the total. So the spiritual realm is three times larger than the material realm in order, a size of order. Understand? So about 75% of the creation is a spiritual world, 25% is a material world. So this is a, just a little bit of perspective. And in the spiritual Vaikuntha we talked about, it is free of misery. So there is what? Guess what? All the doctors are retired in the spiritual world. Why? No disease. No disease. All the psychiatrists are unemployed. Why? Everybody is at a blissful state of mind. There are no police officers because everybody is enjoying cooperatively together. There is no security companies. There is no greed. There is no anger, no envy. It is a land of perfection. It is perfect. Everything is there. Even time is something that is conspicuous by its absence. There's no time factor in the spiritual world because time is a measurement of from beginning to end. But in the spiritual world, there's no end. You're enjoying some satsang, some party. There's no end. There's no deadlines tomorrow. No. It is every turn. There's no getting tired and needing to take rest. Because the body is not a machine. It is spiritual. It is sat, full of eternality. So this is the spiritual world. And it is very, very beautiful. You know, and we'll, we'll see a couple of descriptions. But the temperature is always perfect. The weather is always beautiful. The waters are always clear. There are no weeds in the walking. Everything is just perfect. And you can, in a very sort of crude way, you can sort of kind of compare, you know, the spiritual world to like Disneyland. You know, Disneyland's a place of happiness, right? But we know when we go to Disneyland, where do we spend most of our time? In lines, waiting for fun. In the spiritual world, there are no lines. It is just constant. When we go to Disneyland, we know it's very expensive. So we have to pick and choose. Maybe I can do this, but I can't do that. In the spiritual world, resources unlimited. Whatever you desire, it manifests. In Disney World, we know the time clicks, and eventually the park closes. Spiritual world, there's no closure. There's no time. So this is a land. This is what the spiritual world is like. And it is not a land to be understood through speculation. The description of the spiritual world is given extensively in Shastra. And these are just some quotes. Goloka is also called Rindavan. It's full of cows. There are many waterfalls, which are always pouring water. And the sound is so sweet that it covers the sound of the crickets. And because water flows all over, flows all over, the forest always looks very green and beautiful. The inhabitants of Rindavan are never disturbed by the scorching heat of the sun or high summer temperatures or freezing cold Detroit weather. The lakes of Vrindavan are surrounded by green grasses. Various kinds of lotus flowers bloom there. The air blowing in Vrindavan carries the aromatic pollen of those lotus flowers. When the particles of water from the waves of the Yamuna River, the lakes and the waterfalls, touch the bodies of the inhabitants of Vrindavan, they automatically feel a cooling effect. It's like this. There are many descriptions of the spiritual world. And we can imagine... If we find so much beauty in the material world, you know, you can go to the national parks, you can go to a wonderful place. We admire the beauty. Well, this has, if we didn't imagine what the Lord's home must have, if, if the, His creation here has such a, we can just imagine what the uh, home base must look like. So this, but it is not left for speculation. All the detail is given of exactly what the spiritual world is like. It is not some theoretical or guessing proposition. So from Shastra, we can understand. So with these two creations, but then we can ask the question, why would he create this material world? If everything is so beautiful and perfect in the spiritual world, what was the purpose of creating this one-fourth of creation? Was he bored? Thinking, oh, let me just try something new, experimenting? Or is there another reason? So actually, when we understand, it is us who forced the Lord or asked the Lord to create this place. He did not want to. But we started in the spiritual world. 
And we had a desire. And that desire brought us to the material world. And so that desire, we are going to explain and discuss in more detail. But the key is to understand, we started there, and we ended up here. And so one may ask, how could one leave such a place of perfection? So the Lord describes the, the, the material world as Dukalayam and Ashashvatam. He says, Mamu Pekya Punarajanma, Dukalayam Ashashvatam. Dukalayam, Dukalayam. What it means? It is a place of difficulty. Dukha. And if you're not having Dukha, don't worry. It is also Ashashvatam. Coming around the corner is some difficulties. That is the nature. It is a place that's temporary. So this is the description that the Lord creates. He, of course, describes his spiritual world uh, as well. And what is his authority? We are speaking, trying to evaluate the creation from, on, remember, in one of those grains of sand, on one of the millions of planets within that grain of sand, and with our eyes and telescope, trying to assess creation. But the Lord has complete perspective. So he can see everything. I think we gave the example earlier in one of the question and answer sessions. But you can imagine, you know, you walk onto a, uh, well, I'll give you a different example. Suppose you go into a hotel and there are a hundred rooms in the hotel and you see three of the rooms and you pick the best of the room that you see. Do you have the best room in the hotel? No. You don't know. Maybe. You might get it, right? Or maybe not. But who knows? The owner. If the owner accompanies you and says, these three rooms you see are like this, but there's another three up here that are even better. What is his authentic, uh, authoritative source of knowledge? He is the owner. He knows. So when the Lord describes a place as this and a place as that, he being the creator has the full perspective. Our perspective is very limited. So he describes the material world as a place of Dukkhala and Mishashtatam. That is the nature. And of course, the spiritual world we've already described, it is the place of free of all misery. So let us understand now why this place was created. So when city planners, they go to build a city, they take a large plot of land, and then they start thinking how best to put everything. And they'll place buildings, and they'll place different schools, and theaters, and medical facilities, and places of worship, and universities, and stadiums, and all these things they'll put in different areas, right? And then the lawmakers will create laws. Laws that are there to govern the society so everybody can exist peacefully together and enjoy the different facilities. Right? So what else is needed? What else is missing? when we are putting a city together like this. Well, unfortunately, you also need a prison house. Why? Why does a city planner, even before the city is built, start thinking about a place to put prisoners? Seems like a waste of land and money and resources. Well, you know, as soon as there are laws, there will be a law abiders, and there will be law breakers. There will be those who abide, and those who break. And most of the individuals will abide by the laws. But a small portion will not. And thus, facilities like this are arranged. So law means law. And what is the goal that the government has for the prison? You know, somebody breaks the law, one option is to take them out back and shh, done. But that's not very merciful. Government is more merciful. They want to try to correct. So we call in the U.S. at least what we call the prison? Well, correctional facilities. They're meant to correct. Correct something, right? So the prisons, though, they have some level of punishment. Why is there punishment then? To make them correct. <laughs> to serve as an incentive to purify. So the facilities given in the prison are not so luxurious. If wonderful meals, free housing, plenty of recreational facilities, everything, they're like, all right, sign me up. 
the, the, the facilities are given in very austere ways. There's some difficulty. There's some punishment. But what is the purpose of the punishment? So we don't make a comfortable life there thinking this is the perfection of life. But instead, then we have the incentive to purify. So some basic facilities are given like this. So the material world in our shastras is compared to a prison house. It was created by the Lord based on our desires, which we'll come to in a minute, but is, is a way to inspire us to purify, to purify some mistakes we made. And that is, that now we must be very clear, well, what did we do, right? What do we get purified from? We would say is, it is unlawful to imprison somebody without explaining to them what they did incorrect. So the Lord also will explain that. But this is the, uh, the nature of it. So why has the soul come to the material world? So what did we do? So we are all enjoying with the Lord. And one day, Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita, in the 7th chapter, 27th verse. He says, Icha dvesha. That we had a desire. An Icha. And what was that desire? We wanted to be God. We said, why you, why not me? That desire developed. And from that desire developed, dvesha, this hatred, the envy. What is envy? Envy is, you have a nice iPhone. I want the iPhone. That's jealousy. Envy is, I want your phone, and I don't want you to have it. It's very evil, actually. Right? You're enjoying something. Not that I want to have the same enjoyment, but I want it, and I don't want you to have it. And unfortunately, there we see the world is full of a lot of envy, sometimes very subtle. But we develop some envy of the Lord. And so when envy arises, two things happen. One, we enter the realm of duality. Hot and cold, tall and short, good and bad. In the spiritual world, there is no duality. Because everything is perfect. There's just perfection. So we only see this duality in the material world. So Krishna explains this in one verse in the Bhagavad Gita. But in the Bible, we see this same dynamic explained in the great pastime of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. And God told them, you can enjoy this whole garden, but just one thing, don't eat fruits from this one tree. You can enjoy the fruits from all the garden, but don't eat fruits from this tree. No problem. So like this, Adam and Eve were enjoying and enjoying and enjoying. Then one day Eve was sitting at the bottom of this one tree and one serpent came. Psst, psst, Eve, Eve. Yeah? He says, you know why God doesn't want you to eat this fruit? I don't know, he told me not, but I'm not doing it. Yeah, but do you know why? Why? Because he's jealous of you. If you eat this fruit, you'll become God. So what did she do? Plucked an apple, ate it. And she also gave to Adam. And then three things happened. One, they became aware that they were not even clothed. Before that, no bodily consciousness. They became two, aware, he and she, again, no consciousness. And three, the Lord said, now you will endure a life of hardship and struggle from separation from me. So this is explained in the Bible. The same concept explained in the Bhagavad Gita and our Shastra. That this journey from the spiritual world to the material world, due to this desire. Right? So, but the Lord is very sweet. He said, you want to enjoy separate from me? Well, actually, we cannot enjoy separate from the Lord. Because everything that we try to enjoy, we're dependent on the Lord. But he created his material world in a, way, in a way such that it seems that we can be separated from the Lord. That is the power of mind. But actually, in reality, we are fully dependent on the Lord. And so, the Lord said, okay, you can come to this material world and try to enjoy it. But my dear child, I am coming with you. Yes, we left out of some envy and even some dwesha. Dwesha is a strong word. But he said, no, I'm coming with you. And he sits in our heart as Paramatma. He said, Atma Jiva sitting in a heart. And who was right next to us? Paramatma. The Lord said, I'm here. Whenever you desire to come back, 
You will not have to search long and far. I'll be there right next to you to inspire you, to bring you back home, back to where you belong. So this is the journey that we take. So the material world, this creation, was our choice. It was not God's choice. It was our choice. And some might times we ask, well, why can't I enjoy separate from Krishna? Well, the simple fact we established previously is, what are we the proprietors of? You can only enjoy what you own. Own permanently. You know, the person in the house that had all those cool toys, boats, and pools, and everything. We can enjoy only as long as that person allowed us to. Because they're the owner. So at the end of the day, when we boil down, what did we come into this world with? And what are we going to leave it with? So everything we're enjoying between point A and point B is someone else's resources. Ultimately it's us. So our ability to independently enjoy is not there. But due to Maya, Krishna allows us to pretend. And thus we encounter all the Dukkhalaya and the that we experience. You know, it's like the chauffeur of this car thinks, oh, I have a fancy car I can drive. Can they drive it any which way they want? No. Because they are not the owner. They can drive the car, but they have to drive it in accordance with the instructions of the Lord. So the Lord has given us many new resources also in this world. He says, Ishavas Yamidam Sarvam Yat Kincha Jigat Jigat Tena Taptena Bunjita Madgadaha Kashasudana. This is the first verse from Shia Shapanisha. He says, Everything in the world, animate and inanimate, is coming from me. And to all the living entities, I have given them a quota of resources that they can use for their sustenance. So though we don't own it, the Lord has provisioned the world with sufficient resources for everyone. And we see in nature, material world, how, who is feeding all the elephants? Elephants eat 400 pounds of food a day. Do they go to Costco? <laughs> Provided by nature. Who is feeding the tiny ant? How the ant knows that a piece of mango is on the dining table and they are situated so far away? Krishna is in their heart also. It's fine. Go this way. There's nice food for you. The Lord is providing for everyone according to quota. But man, what they do? Humans, they overindulge. They get greedy. You put a bag of rice in the jungle, all the birds will come and each will take a few, few grains and take away. You put a bag of rice in the middle of Somerset Mall, what will happen? First person will take it home and nobody else will enjoy it. <laughs> this is what happens. This is animal kingdom versus human kingdom. Right? But sufficient resources are there. But our ability to enjoy independent is not. So why do we have to come here to figure this out? Well, we are stubborn. You know, parents always understand this. Sometimes we tell a child, don't do this, it's not good for you. And what does child do? We did it too, right? No. But sometimes we don't learn until we experience. Mother says, this is a pot of boiling water. Child sees bubbles. Don't touch, it's hot. What does child do? Never again will touch boiling water. We have to experience it once to then be convinced this is not good for us. Because hearing from mother wasn't sufficient. Hearing from the Lord, my dear child, don't leave. You're going to a place of difficulty, of suffering. We heard it, but we didn't believe. So now we have to experience it. But now having experienced it, the Lord says, one who returns to my world never has to return back never comes back to this place again. Ever. Why? Because now having experienced it once, there's no need. So, from the highest planet down to the lowest in the material world, it's the same. So we had it, but we didn't believe it. So what we are doing here, we're trying to enjoy the material world, which is like a play world. You know, this young girl, she wants to cook in the kitchen. But she says, Mom, I want to cook by myself. Is that safe for the child? No. So what does mother do? She sets up a little play kitchen. And says, okay, you can uh, cook by yourself in your play kitchen. 
But after playing in this play kitchen for some time, what does a young girl want to do? She says, Mom, I want to cook with you in the real kitchen. And then, this is like us. We are in the play kitchen. We are in the play world. Everything in the material world, it is a reflection of what exists in the spiritual world. Understand this. Everything in the material world is a reflection of what exists in the spiritual world. So by definition, whatever it is we are trying to enjoy here, it exists in its pure state in the spiritual world. When you look in the mirror, can you see something that is not on your original face in the reflection? It has to be, everything here has to be there. That is a reflection. But it is in a distorted form. So we are trying to enjoy in this play kitchen, trying to enjoy separate from the Lord. But eventually, we'll stop banging our head against the wall. Bang, out, bang, out, bang, out. Eventually, why am I banging my head? And then I realize, wait a minute. Real enjoyment exists, not trying to be by myself in this temporary material world, but actually enjoying with the Lord in the spiritual world. This is the realization that we are embarking upon having a subject here. So the Lord created the prison for some punishment. And again, what is the punishment for? Purification. Who is the beneficiary of the purification? We have this experience as parents. When we have to punish a child, do we enjoy it? No. Do we get joy out of it? But do we do it? Yes. Why? Yeah. Why do we do it? To purify. Understand the Do you punish the second neighbor's child? But you punish your own child. Why? To correct them. Why do you care to correct them? Related. Because we love them. Because you love them. The love is what inspires one, even though one doesn't enjoy it. Krishna loves us all extraordinarily. And the difficulties also are the inspiration to purify. Because it is for our good. Just as in the mother and father sometimes have to endure that activity. But they do it only to their children, not to the neighbor's children. That is a different relationship. So what is it that we are purifying from? Let us come to it. First of all, the punishment. What are the punishments? Come back to this. Right? All the different activities, birth, death, old age, disease, adhyapni, kadubhauti, kadidaiti, all these difficulties, they are there. And who is giving it to us? She is a jailer. She is a superintendent. Dur means difficulty. God means to get out. This is the position. And she has this trident. Right? Trying to make sure that actually we find the inspiration to purify and to come back home, back to God. So what is it that we are trying to purify from? Okay? If we don't know, then how can we possibly correct? So these are the six contaminations that exist. There's illusion, pride, anger, greed, envy, and lust. You know, illusion. We become illusion to who am I? I think I'm this body, and then I continue to act in this way. I'm in illusion thinking I am the proprietor. And so I'm enjoying all of God's resources without ever acknowledging that He is giving. If somebody came into our house and enjoyed everything of ours and never acknowledged even our existence, would we be very happy with them? If you go into the supermarket and try to enjoy the owner's uh, fruits without paying for them, what happens? Yes. So we are an illusion. We have some pride. We forget to acknowledge. Yes, I am a limited doer. The Lord is the supreme doer. I have lust. This intense hankering. You want to see lust? You just take a small piece of candy and hold it just out of the reach of a young child. We have lust too. We may not throw temper tantrums and such, but we see it. Through intense endeavor, I have to have it, I have to have it. It consumes our whole consciousness. We cannot get it out of our mind. It's so overpowering, this intense.
intense desire for something, right? So these hankerings. And then we have greed. This greed is so brutal. You know, one desire leads to two more. And two desires leads to four more. And like this, where it ends, you know? I want one car, then two cars, then a BMW. One house, two house, lake house. Always want more and more and more. And that's why we see the people working to their 70s, 80s just to accumulate more and more. For what good? They're never going to be even able to use what they're working so hard for. But it is this unsatiated greed. And then we see anger. What is anger? It is a desire unsatisfied. That's anger. When there is material lust, anger is guaranteed. Because you want something so bad. And if you don't get it, you're upset. And if you get it, you're also angry soon because you're going to lose it. It's temporary. And that's why we see all the root cause of anger. Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita, this krodha, it results from uncontrolled lust. Envy, we talked about it. So evil. Could you imagine a society free of all of this? Anybody would like to live in a society like this? Where it exists? In the spiritual world. It's not in Hawaii, on the beaches of the Maldives, Antarctica, or anywhere else. It exists only in the spiritual world. And that is the... So how to become purified? from all this. It seems so daunting. Well, we started to explain last time. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explains, Jeto Darpana Marjanam. What is the best cleansing that soap that cleanses that heart? Remember that diamond buried in mud? How do we bring that shining luster back? We have to remove the mud. How do we remove? This is the mud. This is the covering of the soul. How do we bring back its original, pure, sweet state? Just through the chanting of the holy name. There is no other way, there is no other way, there is no other way. Then, chanting of the holy names, chanting of the holy names, chanting of the holy names. So powerful of these holy names. But this is the means. So purification doesn't have to happen to some individual. Just like chanting, the natural byproduct is these, these are temporary impurities. And the original eternal state of the soul will actually shine through. So this is the opportunity we have. So let us take a deeper look at this prison house example. So I may ask, you know, what kind of prison is this? You know, I'm free to move here and there. Well, the Lord explains this in this uh, in the Bhagavad Gita. That the the soul it is seated on a machine. Made up of material energy. What is that machine? It is the body. These bodies are also a type of prison. It limits the ability for us to enjoy. If I'm in a human body, I can enjoy pizza and an iPhone. If I'm in an ant body, can I enjoy? So the type of body I have also has a limiter on the types of enjoyment I have. Just like in a human form, if I have a very able body, I can enjoy so many activities. But if I have a, a lame body and I cannot, I'm limited. Okay, so this body that the soul is residing in also forms some sort of limiter. But we know that like when you go to a prison, you have to exchange your clothes for some new clothes. So similarly, when we came from the spiritual world down to material world, we exchange. We had a, a spiritual body that is full of stuff, chitta and ananda, and we acquired a new body. Just as Somebody has many different types of outfits, right? The soul can also acquire many different types of bodies. Same person, so many types of outfits. Fancy, casual, sporty, this, that. Right? So in the Padma Purana, it explains that there are 8.4 million species of life. These are different clothes for the soul. Different bodies that the soul can assume, right? Modern scientists talks about about 1.5 million, but they're only looking in one planet. They're not understanding the totality of creation. Every year they're finding some 10, 15,000 new species. But in our Padma Purana, it's given exactly, and it categorizes it. 
by different things. Like, there are so many different aquatic species. There are two million non-moving species like trees and plants and you know, different types of flowers. There are 1.1 million species of insects and reptiles, both flying and not. So much variety of creation that the Lord has. We have one million species of birds. Lots of birds. And we go to a zoo or an aquarium, we get some understanding of the vastness of creation, but it's only a sample. Three million quadrupeds, so different four-legged animals, so many, 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 many different types of species of life are there. 8.4 million exactly. And even in the human species, there are many different species of human. We see, not only on this planet, but also up to the different heavenly planets. So we have many different types of prisons, if you will, for the soul. Just like in the in, in America, we have these like you know white collar prisons, you know really luxurious facilities, but still prisons. Then we have these like medium prisons with medium facilities, then these really harsh, difficult places. So like that, we have different, based on the degree of our envy, based on the degree of our activities, we get different types of bodies. Just like the, based on the degree of the crime we committed, we get a different type of residence. Similarly, our soul takes residence in different types of bodies based on the degree of its uh, and That will become more clear as we talk about laws of karma. So in the human species of life, of course, we have the most facilities, that was like the white collar, you know, dealing. we have the best facilities. You know, the, the animal species of dogs and cats and, you know, different, and they are in the medium. And then, you know, the most difficult, the trees, and trees have to stand, sit there in the wind. You go and, you know, insult it, nothing it can do, just sits there. So it has a difficult life. So this is the different gradations. It's based on the different activities. And I told us, you know, one, my wife asked me to take the spider out of the house. I put the spider in my hand, I was walking, I said, the only difference between this spider and me is the degree of misuse of our independence. This spider has made some decisions in his past and now is in the spider body. I have made some decisions in my past, I'm in this body. But did this spirit soul, part and parcel of the Lord, eternally, originally coming from the spiritual world? And I understand. There's no difference. Just the body it is occupying today due to its past actions. When we start to have this self-realization, we start to understand the true unity of all of us, not only in the human species, but in all species of earth. But there's no difference. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. I have a question. Yeah. Um, is there like a hierarchy of species, like species in love, living in water, like lower than non-living? Versus mm -hmm. like insects and reptiles and stuff, and humans are at the top. Yes, this, the hierarchy is based on consciousness, and so there's a gradation of consciousness that defines, and the opportunity to exercise its senses. Um, so the, the 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 depth of the senses and the ability to enjoy different things is awarded. And again, this will become more clear next week when we talk about the laws of karma. But one is awarded. Uh, a more suitable body or a less suitable body based on our past actions. Just like, you know, a prisoner, again, is awarded a certain cell based on its activities. Someone who does more harsh crimes gets a more harsh environment. So it's, it's not random that that spider is a spider. It's not random. It is prescribed by the laws of karma. And that is why, again, there is no real difference. Right? So when they ask, how are we bombed, right? A prison means there's a perimeter, there's a fence, barbed wire, a guard tower. So what is binding us, right? What prevents us from just going to the spiritual world? It's not gravity. Gravity might get you to the top of one grain of sand, but you're not going to be able to cross the covering of the universes. It is not gravity that binds us. Let me assure you that. This is the trick of Maya. This is the challenge of the illusory energy. Because we don't feel like we're in our prisons, then what happens? 
they make no effort to try to get out. Until I actually understand and learn that there's actually life beyond what I can see, then the inspiration to get out isn't there. If a prisoner was sitting in the prison house and simply enjoying the facilities of the prison the best that they could and made no effort to get out, would we consider that very intelligent? Would we consider that a good use of their time? If we live in this world simply eating, sleeping, mating, and defending, and not inquiring, then we are no different. We're in the same situation. So this is the opportunity is to be, remember again what life is like in the original place that we came from, outside of this prison house. You know, Shilap Prabhupada was once asked, you know, are you here to convert everybody? So I'm not here to convert anybody. I'm here to help everybody remember again who they once loved. And that is the Supreme Lord. So how are we bound, specifically? We are bound by the three modes of material nature. Sattva gun, Rajagun, and Tamogun. These guna means rope also. It means modes of nature also rope. How do you make a rope? You take three strings, thin, thin strings, and you braid them. And then you take three of those such strings and you braid them. And then you take three of those such and braid and keep doing. And eventually that rope made up of individual tiny threads becomes so strong it can hold a giant steamship in a dock. This is how a rope works. Well, similarly, the modes of material nature like that. There are three modes, but they, are, they intertwine so deeply, so tightly, that they keep us here in the material world. And how does it work? Well, these three modes are like this. So what is mode of goodness? Oh, I'm feeling good today, inspired to go do something in good society, help somebody. I'm in the mode of goodness. Sometimes, oh, I'm just too busy, gotta work, 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 run, 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 run. Now I'm in the mode of passion. Other times, I just want to sleep. Tune out the world. I'm in the mode of ignorance. So we go through these different modes. We are not squarely in one. We have a combination of all three. But one mode is predominant in us. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But today as we observe the world, most of the world is in the mode of passion and ignorance. We see it. So much extreme endeavor. Work, work, work. We're working more now than we've ever worked in our lives before with all the hopes of work, work, work during the week to then enjoy through intoxication and other types of, you know, modes of ignorance in the, in the weekends. This is the life that revolves. This is what's created the norms of the society. But the Lord explains a very powerful statement. And I warn you, it's a little bit shattering to the ego. He says, Prakute this material nature is actually the doer of everything. You see these gentlemen, what is pulling them up and down? I think I'm moving my arm like this, right? But am I? I am desiring to move my arm. But am I controlling the neurons firing in my brain down my spinal cord to twitch the muscles so that the hand moves? Do I have control of that? Ask a paralyzed person. They want to move their arm, but it doesn't work. Because that nature, does. it is actually the modes of nature that is carrying out all the uh, workings. Our simple uh, opportunity to desire to move my hand. And the Lord says, Ahankara vimudatma. Don't let your false ego think you are the doer. As I mentioned, it's a little bit of an ego shattering, but it shows our dependence on the Lord. So yes, we desire, and then our hands move. There's a lot to the statement that we'll unpack as we get into the Bhagavad Gita. But I just want to, it helps to illustrate that these modes are very, very powerful. So let us dissect the three modes in a little bit more detail. So these modes are like, you know, mode of goodness is like a golden chain. Mode of passion is like a silver chain. And mode of ignorance is like an iron chain. But whether I have a golden chain, a iron, silver chain, or iron chain, a chain ultimately is a chain. It is something that keeps me bound here in the world. Okay? 
And we can compare it similar to these like A class, B class, and C class prison cells. So in the prison, the C class prisoner, they want to get to the B class. Why? Because they have a fan in their room. Ah, oh, this would be ideal. And the B class prisoner, they want to get to the A class. Why? Because they have one TV in their room. Ah, oh, this is like the best. But the A class prisoner, where are they? I'm better off than the B class. I got better than the C class. I think I have the best it is. I'm good. But what in that effort have they completely forgotten? They're still in jail. What is life truly like? And again, if we observe somebody thinking like this, we think, wow, this is craziness. Why are they not making an effort? So all three are binding, right? So, but the challenge in the A class is one thinks that they have the best already. Right? So what is the mode of goodness? Let us discuss this um, in a little bit more detail. So the mode of goodness is one who is following good qualities, generally pious, doing good things in life, being careful to avoid sinful activities, uh, being generally a righteous, good person in the world. And that has earned them some better facilities within this world. That has earned them some better facilities. And so they are relatively happy, more happy than others. But ultimately, it is also a chain because it is preventing them from experiencing the real, complete happiness. And sometimes when we're in the mode of goodness, we think, wow, I've got the best there is, but not realizing that there's actually much more beyond that. And what's even more dangerous about that is because of the lustful nature of the material energy and our material contaminated senses, one may be in the mode of goodness, but through temptation, may get dragged down to even these lower modes. So even the mode of goodness is ultimately dangerous. What is the mode of passion? Work, work, work. I don't have time to do anything else. No time. What is coming to the journey of self-discovery? What are you going to do for my bank account? What's in it for me? This is the mode of passion. Very, very, you know, heavy activity. And so they are bound by their activity. What binds in the mode of goodness? Their feeling of relative happiness. Thus they don't endeavor to get out. In, in mode of passion, intense endeavor. And thus, no endeavor to get out. And we see that this envy and comparing is very prominent in mode of passion. Oh, you have a watch? I have a Rolex. You have a new car? I have a BMW. You have a nice house? I have a mansion. This nature we find very prevalent in the mode of passion. And then the mode of ignorance. Mode of ignorance is, is really dangerous because what they think is right is actually wrong and what they think is wrong is actually right. It's like a complete opposite. Yeah. What is success in the mode of ignorance? If I can sleep 12 hours uninterrupted, I won. What have we accomplished? Yes, the body needs its rest, no doubt, but within reason. But this mode of ignorance is, is, is exhibited by this madness, this illusion, this laziness. And we see mode of goodness and mode of ignorance are like opposite, right? People in the mode of goodness get up very early in the morning, four or five o'clock, do yoga, do spiritual activities, exercise. Well, the mode of ignorance, they are finishing their night at three, four o'clock in the morning and taking rest. They're like complete opposite schedules. This is mode of ignorance. And the, the, they're bound basically by illusion and madness. So... We can understand this through a very, you know, uh, relatable uh, set of figures in our Puranas. You know, we just celebrated Vijay Dashmi and uh, three famous brothers. Who is in the mode of goodness? <laughs> Always the same. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Everybody in Robin's court was saying, oh, you deserve her, you deserve her. But he said no. He was guided by righteousness. And ultimately, he was kicked out, but then returned back. Now, Ravan, he was the mode of passion to the fullest. If you look up in the dictionary, mode of passion, you'll find Ravan. You know, he had everything. He had a huge city of gold, so many queens, so much wealth, so much family, so much power. He had did intense 
austerity. He was intelligent to acquire all of that. He had everything. So when Suparnaka came with her nose cut off, Raman didn't care what he was worried about. I need mine. That's motor passion. What's in it for me? He didn't care. So she knew how to get to him. Oh, you should know these brothers. There's a beautiful queen. More beautiful than any queen you have. You deserve her. That got Raman's attention. Why? He's fully in the mode of passion. Though he had many queens, he wanted her. And everything was unfolding right in front of his eyes. He was losing everything. And even after the last moment, all he had to do was give back Mother Sita and everything would have been saved. But did he do it? This is mode of passion. It completely blinds our intelligence. We know right from wrong, but when we are overcome by the mode of passion, it overpowers our intelligence. I don't want to do it, but I still do it. And Ravan has this exemplified in spades. And we know when Lord Ramchandra is shooting heads, when one disappears, what happens to the, after one is knocked off? Another one pops up. Take one out. This is the mode of passion. Yeah. And then Vibish, uh, uh, sorry, Kumbhakarna. Right? Kumbhakarna, you have to be very careful with him. He was asleep for six months. And when he wakes up, what does he do? <laughs> the servants are very smart because if there's no food there, they'll eat him, them. So before they wake him, they bring all kinds of food and liquor and all this stuff. Then they wake him. It's dangerous because otherwise they will not wait for something to get ready from the kitchen. This is Kumbhakarna. He would eat then for six months, and then he would sleep for six months. This is mode of ignorance in this case. So this gives us some way to relate. So we can judge the modes by the time of day in which we are active. You know, in the early morning times, the temples are full, the yoga studios are full, parks are full, people are doing activities. In the midday time, subways and freeways and office buildings are full, and in the night. Bars, restaurants. Anybody gets invited to a party at 7 a.m.? No? No? Still not yet? Almost as my question, anybody woke up wanting to be unhappy. <laughs> Still, I've not got my invitation a.m. I would think it's a typo, right? Mistake. If somebody says, they must have been p.m. This is the way uh, it works. You know, foods. Foods are also organized by the different modes. Foods that are very healthy, nutritious, that extend our life. They are the way of goodness. You know, foods that are very strong, extremely spicy, pungent. You know, when my one friend, <laughs> has a, you know, he used to eat, he would eat Thai food. And he says, if it doesn't hurt going in, it's no good. <laughs> like, really? That's, that's more of a passion. And then foods in mode of ignorance. You know, these are decomposed foods, you know, very old foods, stale foods, putrid. These foods uh, actually disrupt life, create a lot of misery and suffering. So the foods we eat also are organized by the different modes. And so by understanding this, you know, understanding the types of music, you know, we have very nice classical music that's soothing, and we have this, you know, kind of you know, music with some, you know, you know, intense lyrics and then some very dark music. So even the music. So based on the mode that of uh, nature that we are in, we tend to be attracted to different activities, different times of day, different types of music like this. And all of this is being uh, overseen by our superintendent of this jail. And she is motivating us, saying, don't get settled here. Don't be an A-class prisoner even. And what is she trying to inspire us to do? Go back home to where we came. To where we belong, getting out of this material life. So we have to be careful to assess where are we. You know, we seek happiness and activities based on the mode of nature. You know, two people are sitting at a restaurant. One is smoking and enjoying. The other one is eyes are burning and coughing. Right. One is in one mode and another is in another mode. This is the modes of nature. So we can analyze. You know, where am I getting my happiness from? Where, what modes am I in? 
They are very subtle, but we should understand they are binding us here. And if we understand they are binding us, then we can find a way to get out from it. But coming just to the mode of goodness is not sufficient. Why? Because it will just take us to the higher classes of the material world. To get us to the higher realms of that prison house. What we really want to do is get out. So Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita very beautifully, Mamcha yogi bacharena, bhakti yogena seta, saguna samiti kyachan, brahma goyata kampate. He says, one who does devotional service bhakti, which we'll discuss in the fifth module, A, B, C, D, by doing bhakti, one can at once transcend the modes, get beyond the modes of rajagun, tamagun, and uh, saplagun. Very important, the word Krishna says, at once. It means even in this material body, through devotional service, one can experience the spiritual bliss in life, life that is experienced even in the spiritual world. So one doesn't even have to wait until our next lifetime. But we can start to get a flavor for it, which serves as a great motivation and inspiration to continue. But this is the opportunity. Because if we just become blind to how these modes are working on us, we'll never see the perimeter of this prison house and never make any escape to get out. So this is the material world that we've come to. And we'll talk about the, um, uh, the, the laws of karma now coming up in the next session. But to summarize what we talked about today, the, the, the material world is compared to the prison now with punishment. We know the forms to, so that we can purify. It is our greatest blessing. Like when we have to sometimes punish our children, it is out of love only. And we exchange different bodies based on the degree of our misaction and ultimately it is the modes that is binding us here. So I'm out of time, but I'm quickly just going to discuss this in 30 seconds. So there are two aspects of time. There's universal time and there's a time cycle of life. So the universe is created according to a very specific time cycle. It is not, again, random or speculation. So each universe exists for 100 years of Lord Brahma. In 100 years of Lord Brahma, he is each of these yugas. So there are four yugas. Kali Yuga, Dwapra Yuga, Trisha Yuga, Satya Yuga. It equals 4.32 million years. When this cycle 71 times, that is 12 hours of Lord Brahma. That is then another 12 hours is 24. So it ends up being 8.6 billion years is 24 hours times 365 times 100. That is the duration of the universe. Not meant for any speculation. It's given exact. And where are we currently? We are in the age of Kali Yuga in the 28th cycle of the 71. So we are in a late morning time of Lord Brahma who is past the age of 50 years. So this universe that we are in is just past 50 years in its duration. There are 5,000, couple hundred years elapsed in Kali Yuga. So roughly another 427,000 years remain. And all of this is given exacting in our Shastra. And again, no need to speculate how much time is left. Then we have the life cycle. So each and every living entity that is uh, with a soul, it goes through six stages. Birth, then it grows, it maintains, it produces, it ultimately dwindles, and then of course, the end. So we have these. So why do we go through these cycles? What is driving us to this is ultimately the laws of karma. And that is going to bring us to next week's topic. So why do bad things happen to good people? It is due to the law of karma. And so now we have understood what brought us here. We're now going to then discuss, as we navigate this material world, we incur karma. Good karma means good reaction. Bad karma means bad reactions. What is good and what is bad is not left to our discretion. It is left to the laws of the creator. And so we're going to understand how this works 
And then explain, well then why is it that I see somebody doing only good, why they're getting bad? I'm going to explain that. And also, I see somebody doing only bad, yet they're getting good. Also a perfect answer for that. And so that's what we'll be uh, discussing in the next uh, session. Okay? Just going to conclude with a quick introduction. Very important. So some of you may be knowing. But this Kartik month, it starts on Sunday and continues until November 6th. This is the most auspicious month of the year. The month of Dhamana. Our Puranas and our Shastra glorify this profusely. And next week I'll bring some quotes from Skanda Puran, Padma Puran. Uh, so much now talks about how powerful. And we can consider it, you know, Shiva Prabhupada compared it to a giant sale. What does that mean? You know, when you go into a store, and if it is having a giant sale, you can go in with a little bit of money and walk out with a lot of things. Similarly, during this month of Karthi, whenever devotional activities we do, it is multiplied many thousand times more than when we do it in other times. It is really the power-packed opportunity for us to really accelerate our journey uh, back home, back to God. And so this month takes place, and as I mentioned, there are supercharged blessings. And we can observe it by many ways, but three uh, primary or very important ways for us to observe Karthik. One, daily chanting. Take to the process of chanting these holy names. They're so powerful. I cannot overestimate or overemphasize the power and potency of chanting. Particularly during this month of Karthik. Every round of Japa we chant, the benefit is multiplied many, many times. We are making huge deposits into our spiritual bank account. And that bank account will take with us forever. Our Chase and BFA account, not so much. But this one, it's, it's our eternal. Two, um, offer a gyan. Once a mouse in the temple bit into a uh, burning gyan, and it got caught between its teeth, and because it was burned, it was jumping up and down. And the Lord took that as being offered a gilam, and that mouse was liberated. So powerful. Millions and millions and millions of lifetimes of sins that we may have incurred are eradicated with the offering of a gilam. So next week, we'll all offer a gilam uh, to Rabbi Damodar here and obtain this great blessing. So please also bring your friends and family and loved ones, whoever can participate. But at home also daily, just offer one gilam to Lord Krishna and you'll get this unlimited blessing. And then finally, you can observe by making a Kartik Vrat. So by taking some austerity, um, you know, it can be simple as, you know, I'm going to abstain from eating ice cream. You know, taking out some austerity, chanting a little more extra, or I'm going to, you know, do something, taking some vow. Uh, and by holding that for the entire duration of month, one receives great purification and advancement in this journey. And so, for those who are interested, I, I do this every year. So I have little Kartik vow sheets. If you like, you can write down some vow, and then I'll offer these to the Lord in the temple. Uh, on Sunday, I'll be offering them. So you can write, we have pens and a little envelope and you can put your vow, whatever you like. Even kids do it. It's uh, very uh, nice. So it can be very simple or very, you know, intense. But do something and you'll find great benefit. Okay? And then we'll be just, uh, reciting this Dhamadar Ashtakam. It's at eight uh, uh, verses that glorify this month of Dhamadar and Lord Dhamadar himself. And we'll be discussing that. Uh, and then Sunday at the temple, this Sunday, uh, we'll have our first um, you know, sort of um, celebration of Kartik Mass, offering of Gilabs at the temple. Uh, I'll also be giving a class about the glories of Kartik and the glories of this Dhamadar Lila. So if you'd like to join for that, uh, we'll also have some other festivals. So this whole month, the next four weeks, uh, lots of different festivals and activities uh, that are truly. Uh, uh, inspiring, and they actually give us a glimpse 
into the spiritual world, what awaits us as we continue on this journey. So please uh, participate in that. Okay. So next week, again, we'll begin with a discussion on the laws of karma. So what what time is your lecture? Uh, 4.15. Any uh, comments or questions for today? Yes. How does one study how to impact the animal food or uh, also the journey of the soul? So how does one's childhood affect one's adulthood and ultimately the journey of the soul? So every activity we make in this human form of life, we accrue karma. And again, we'll talk more about this next week, good or bad. And what we do now, the soul is our future. So the activities that I take now create you know, outcomes that are waiting for me in the future. And sometimes those outcomes come very quickly, and sometimes they come after a long time. Um, so the, we come into this world with a certain level of nature. We know this, right? If you have multiple children, they're born in the same home, same family, same foods, same smells, everything. Are they the same? No. They have a different nature. Right? Even looks, I'm not going their natures are different. Why? Because they come, we come, they're carrying their nature from their prior lives. So that nature exhibits itself in childhood. So the childhood is not the beginning of our nature. Right? We already come into this world with the nature. And then that gets developed and cultivated based on our association. And that morphs into our future life. And we'll talk about the power of association in the fifth module. But we know if uh, we want our child to be good nature, what do we want to do? We associate them with good nature people. Right? Association is key. Okay? So whatever nature we have today as adults, we know we can also continue to modify and, and advance that through good association. So, but our future is not fixed. Uh, you know, some people feel, you know, my destiny, I'm destined to be, you know, maybe my current destiny, but that destiny can also be altered. It can be changed by the power of bhakti. Yes. Krishna says in the 12th verse of the second chapter, right in the beginning, he says, never was there a time that I did not exist, nor you. Nor in the future shall either of us cease to exist. So what that means is our individuality is eternal. We are always individual persons in the material world or the spiritual world. In the spiritual world, we do not merge into anything. We are individual. The uh, example is given, when the river merges into the ocean, that is true, but we are not the river. We are the aquatics. If there is a fish in the river, and that water flows into the ocean, that fish moves from the river into the ocean. So similarly, the soul might go from the material world to the spiritual world, but it maintains its individuality. And that's why uh, Krishna says, Mavai Vamsho Jiva Loka, Jiva Bhuta Sanatana. Sanatana means eternal. This realm is not eternal. So our individuality today is not something new. We maintain that. And so in the spiritual world, we also have relationship with the Lord. It is called rasa. There is different types of relationship. There are friendship relationships, parental relationships. There are different rasas. Okay? But yes, there's individuality in the spiritual world and individuality in the material world. And we have a form. We have a body in the spiritual world. But it's a spiritual body. This body is a machine, right? It has veins and arteries and lungs. It's a machine. But in the spiritual world, our body is sakchitananda. It doesn't wear, it doesn't dissipate, it doesn't age, it doesn't grow. But there is a body. And that type of body is also described in Shastra. What different types of body one gets in the spiritual world. So yeah, it's a very important concept. It's very misunderstood when people talk about 
you know, merging into Brahman, these sorts of things. Even merging into Brahman, you can merge into Brahma Jyotir, but you are not losing your individuality. You are floating in the effulgence. Imagine you're on a raft in a giant open lake, and you're floating. You're still a person on that raft. You haven't merged into that lake. So like that, there is that type of sayujya mukti, but one still in that realm even does not lose the individuality. For example, for example, uh, uh, birth and death. You, uh, you said that uh, birth, death, uh, birth, uh, and you told that some uh, uh, some stages. So, for example, if uh, ki uh, kids are uh, dying at uh, uh, three or four years old, kids are dying. But uh, where they will go? Because they don't know how uh, we have to chant or not, uh, uh, how to connect back to the God. So, where they will go? Because if, if they have died. So, they will go. Uh, they take a rebirth or they will go to Godhead? Because no, they will they'll take a rebirth based on what their consciousness was at that time. Those three, four words gets also. Of course, any, any age. So depending on how they leave this body, they'll take a new body. So the age um, doesn't matter. It's the current, so when we, I'm gonna be getting into a little bit of next week's session, but when we enter a body, we live in that body for a predetermined number of breaths, not time, it's not based on time. It's based on the number of breaths. So based on my karma, you know, that spider might have had to take 12 births as a spider. It was so such duration, based on the karma. Very scientific and exacting. Then it'll move to the next species, and the next species. So actually, we as spirit soul, we have transmigrated all 8.4 million species of life. You remember back in the very first session, I said, Atato Brahma Jignasa, quoting Vyasadeva, and said, we have worked very hard to acquire this human form of life. Why? Because we are once that spider, and the ant, and the quadruped, and the tree, and the moss, and the fish, and the raccoon. All 8.4 million species of life we have transversed. And now we have come to the top, the human form of life. And from here, we have an option. Either to get out, or to risk Atmaha. And the Shia Shapanishad says Atmaha, killer of the soul. Wait a minute, the soul is eternal. Not killing the soul. Killing the soul's opportunity to get out. And then what we risk, if we don't make good decisions, is cycling back down all 8.4 million species of life again. So this is a very pivotal juncture in this human form of life. We have worked so hard to acquire and if we don't use our intelligence to inquire, to figure this out and start to shape our life accordingly, then we'll once again be the spider being carried out but probably won't be carried out. <laughs> we'll be smashed. Show the ignorance mm. sometimes. How we can minimize that ignorance and how we can do a better job mm. in order to. Tadvini paripate na paripasana sevea put bhakti tegana, jnani nasta darshina. Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita 4th chapter. 4th chapter is entitled Transcendental Knowledge. How to get transcendental knowledge? Transcendental mean? means knowledge that transcends the material universe. The ultimate knowledge. How do we get it? He says we must inquire from a bona fide guru. Through guru, knowledge becomes uh, available. And that's how we must ultimately rid ourselves of ignorance. And that is why Krishna is sitting in our heart as Paramatma. So he is inspiring from within, and externally we become inspired. And by the combination of both, we acquire the knowledge we need to find success. But knowledge has value. 
when it is applied. And the doctor tells me, don't eat sugar, you are a diabetic. That's knowledge. But that knowledge is only value if I stop eating sugar. Okay? So the value of knowledge is in its application. That's why the fifth module is the most important. Because we've acquired a lot of knowledge. And now we're going to talk about how to apply it. Okay? And if we do, that ignorance will dissipate. Om Jnana Timirandasya Jnananjana Shalakya Chakshuru Milita Mene Tasmai Shri Guru Bhani. I chant that verse as the opening invocation prayer. What are we saying? Om Jnana Timirandasya Jnananjana. I am born in the darkest of ignorance. And who opened my eyes with a torch of knowledge? Guru Bhai. So I'm offering my obeisance to Guru. Because they have, wherever there is light, by definition, they go to peace. That is how we come out free from ignorance. And that is why Krishna gives Shastra, he gives discipline succession, he comes and resides in your heart through so many means. To, when we desire it, it will happen. But we have to desire it. Yes. So Krishna is the author of all yoga systems. So of course, so in the third chapter, he speaks about karma yoga. Then he speaks about, um, then not only karma yoga, he speaks about sakam karma yoga and nishkam karma yoga. Two types of karma yoga. Then he speaks about jnana yoga. Then he speaks about ashtanga yoga. Then buddhi yoga. And ultimately bhakti yoga. So he gives from third chapter to sixth chapter. At the end of the sixth chapter, he gives a summary statement. Yoginama pisarvesha mantgate nantaratmana shaddhavan vachite yoma same yukta kaumana. He says, of all the yogis, one who in faith, shaddhava, becomes my devotee, the bhakti yogi, they are the highest of all, and most united with me. So the yoga is called a ladder. They are rungs, steps. So it is not karma yoga takes you one direction, jnana yoga takes you another direction, bhakti yoga. No, they are sequential steps on a ladder. And Krishna explains. And, and each step is analytically what is present in karma yoga, what is added, the little features added in jnana yoga. What's added to Gyan Yoga, that means Woody Yoga, was God, you know, like that is all of you. Yeah, so jnana yoga, so what, what, what jnana yoga, we should understand what jnana yoga is. Jnana yoga is the recognition that I am not matter, I am spirit. But it does not yet conclude to know that I am spirit connected to what? So I have detached from matter, but I haven't yet attached to something else. So it's, I'm in between. So jnana matures into bhakti, when I detach from matter and attach to Krishna. So the maturation of jnana is bhakti. Because in jnana there is a, again, detachment but not yet attachment. And the spirit soul, because it's active, it needs some attachment. We cannot be detached. So the idea of complete idle meditation doesn't work. Because the soul is active. So we can temporarily go against that nature, but ultimately the active nature of the soul will dominate. Right? So, um, jnana yoga is a step that then matures to bhakti. So, to your point, you'll practice bhakti and you'll see that, okay, you know, there are still impurities. Of course. 
And Srila Prabhupada gives many different examples. Uh, one, you know, why I still see karma or this impurities. But if bhakti is a process of purification. But it's not, I put my hand in the bead bag once and I become pure. It is a process to become pure. So as I practice bhakti, I should be seeing these, um, these qualities, the bad qualities reducing and the good qualities increasing. But if I am not, then it is a, some flaw in my execution. If I go to the gym and my body is not transforming, do I blame the gym or my application of the gym? Which is a fault. My application. The gym is not broken. It's how I'm using the gym that is broken. Because I'm going to the gym and eating ice cream cones. So we can practice bhakti. But if we don't practice bhakti under the proper guidance, then the result will not manifest. Bhakti is not meant to be some speculation of what is bhakti. Bhakti is given in Yabhilashita Shunyam, Gyanakamari Namatam, Anukuli in the Krishna Anushanam, Bhakti Uttama. This is Uttama Bhakti. And what Uttama Bhakti is practiced? 64 different angas of Bhakti. So it's all prescribed in Shastra. So if I go to the gym and I'm not finding a transformation in the body, what I do? I hire a trainer and say, show me how to do this. And then the transformation occurs. Right? So we must apply the principles of bhakti with the instructor who is busy. So if we see that experience, it is not a flaw in the bhakti, it is the misapplication uh, in some aspect. Of it. That's how we can understand that. But because ultimately, remember, Krishna tells Arjuna, he's explained from all these yogas, he's explained everything, and he says, Sarva Dharma Prithyaja. All Dharma? You should abandon. Mam ekam. Sharanam vaja. You should surrender unto me. It has become my devotee. Man manava bhavad bhakto majaji mam namaskuru. Do these four things. Become my devotee. Think of me. Offer your obeisances. Offer your homages. Pati jane priyosi me. Because you are my friend, I shall deliver you. So, this is the ultimate conclusion. Uh, but the application is very key. Okay? We'll talk a lot about the different yogas as we go through chapters 3, 4, 5, and 6. Because those four chapters contain all the different yoga systems. Any other um, questions or comments? So, so in that uh, sloka, we are not the doer, Mithal Maitri is the doer, right? But if Mithal Maitri is doing, then what I am doing here? <laughs> yes, okay, good. I was hoping somebody would come to that because if not, it's going to happen. Again. If everybody did not hear the question, he said, Great, Prakuti Kriyamanani, if Prakuti is the doer, I am not the doer then I don't have responsibility, right? <laughs> Why am I being punished? I'm not doing, nature is doing, right? So next time your child goes and slaps another child, the child says, I'm not to do it, Prakute Kriya Mahani, and he's like, some child will say, no, my child. So we must have knowledge. Trust me, my, my son once did that to me. <laughs> so what is this name? So because in the fifth chapter, Krishna says, I am not to do it. So wait a minute, you're, Krishna, you told me I'm not the doer, so who's the doer? What we, have, what we understand is that every action is initiated by our desire. But what we understand by that, that that is the limit of our ability. So I can desire to move my hand. Then whether it moves or not is based on whether I'm qualified due to my past actions to move my hand. If I'm qualified, then Krishna will direct the modes to move the hand. So what moved the hand was the nature. 
But what triggers the impetus to move was my desire. So ultimately, we are accountable and responsible for our actions. You know, when I go and slap somebody, I cannot say, well, that wasn't mine, I didn't do it. That was the neurons farting in my spine. No. I desire, it was sanctioned, and thus, boom. Right? So we are ultimately responsible. Then the karma accrues to me. Otherwise, we just become robots, and we should have no responsibility. So what we do is still based on our desire. And so we have all this knowledge. If we choose not to follow any of it, that is our free will. Krishna will never force us to do bhakti, to do bad, to do it. He'll never force us. It is always going to be our choice. And that is the free will we have. And the reason is very clear. Ultimately, Krishna created all of us to enjoy a loving relationship with each other. Well, if I am forced to love Krishna, what is the prospect of love? There's no love. That's a forced relationship. When I express my free will and willingly forego other activities to then express them, then there's a real emotion of love. Love can only be present with the presence of free will. So thus, every living entity, all of us, we have eternal free will to choose our actions. But we don't have the ability to choose our reactions. Reactions are given to us by nature. But the actions we choose are not us. And like I said last time, I may choose at the end of the day, I want to live in a mansion. Well, that will be fulfilled, but whether I live, again, as the owner or the cockroach is based on my past karma. Understand? So I cannot just dictate, oh, I want to live in, you know, my, I, I, I cannot force, the Lord is not our order taker. You understand? So that is why we have ultimate responsibility for all our actions. And that's why even, we'll talk about this next week, ignorance, not knowing, oh, this was a sin, I didn't know. That's not an excuse. Driving down Big Beaver at 100 miles an hour and saying, oh, police officer, I didn't know the speed limit. Is he going to let you off? If you're driving on the road, you have a responsibility to know the rules. In the human form of life, we have a responsibility to know. The animals, they don't accrue karma. Dog bites another dog, no karma. Because they don't have the conscious interest to understand. Krishna doesn't hold them accountable because they don't have the ability to know. So it's not unjust. When we have the facilities, then comes the responsibility. Okay? Nice question. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay. So shall we play our uh, quiz game? Sure. So I think we have to pair up because it's showing me a limit of <laughs> 20. So we can do teamwork. How about that? Okay. Thank you very much. Shilaprabhupada. Thank you. 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 Th